Saudis, you know what I'm yeah. saying? The Saudis is out there doing that. Is that interesting to you? Is that something like, you know, I would go mess with them if the bag was right? No, yeah, definitely. Um, so to be honest with you, I personally, I can't do that because uh, the way my contract is set up, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't mess with them people um, because, you know, obviously my co I can only work with my own promoter. <laughs> First of all, this is why Tank Davis turned down that huge offer to fight Conor Ben. They can't contractually move. These PBC fighters can't contractually move. I'm wondering how Wilder got out to fight Joseph Parker. How did he get out? Some of these guys better go talk to Deontay Wilder. The other week, David Benavides reached out to Turkey al Sheik because he was so desperate to get the Canelo fight. And now he's telling us, unless Al Heyman authorizes any movement away from the PBC, and now today he's telling us I can't mess with them people um, because you know obviously my co I can only work with my own promoter. <laughs> As of the fifth day of March 2012, between the events here and after, referred to as Athlete and Al Heyman Development Incorporation, here and after referred to as advisor, witness for an inconsideration of the mutual promises covenants, representations, agreements and conditions as set forth herein. The parties here to agree as follows. 1. Exclusive advisory rights. A. Advisor shall have the sole and exclusive right to render services on behalf of athlete in connection with athlete's participation in professional boxing contests or exhibitions and in connection with athlete's participation entertainment performances, personal appearances and endorsement or sponsorship opportunities arising out of or related in any way to athlete's boxing career. Says it all there. They have sole and exclusive right to render services on behalf of athlete in connection with athlete's participation in professional boxing contests. But the likes of Wilder has recently broke off and done his own thing. Daniel Jacobs did. Sabriel Matthias. Richardson Hitchens, who's fighting tonight, and a few others. Frank Sanchez. But David Benavides said it out of his own mouth. He's trapped. You know they got me trapped in this prison of seclusion. David been snitching on himself a lot recently. First he said he wouldn't break his PBC contract to go elsewhere to fight Canelo. Well, how badly does he want to fight? That Samson dude, Team Benavides, spoke to Eddie Hearn about potentially fighting Canelo on the zone. And he said, yeah, as long as we can have the American TV rights. And what Samson was indirectly telling Eddie is that David can't leave the PBC. A big portion of that pay-per-view revenue for that fight is going to be generated in America. And as long as the PBC get that, they don't give a shit where the rest of the pay-per-view buys go. Because they're not paying the purses. And in my opinion, the PBC didn't want David Benavides to get the first crack at Canelo with Amazon. They want to get bang for their buck out of Canelo. So a relatively soft touch like Jamal was perfect. What they didn't like was Canelo wouldn't come down on the guarantee. So the next compromise to ease the burden of the guarantee was to get the zone to share some of the pay-per-view distribution fighting Jaime Munguia. Munguia with that Mexican audience is one of the most popular the zone fighters. Straight up. David's probably never looked on it like that. And all the frustration David is spewing about Canelo, he probably doesn't realize his frustration is with whoever he signed that draconian slave contract with. Ben Shalom rings you after this interview and says, Frank, I want to sit down with you and Eddie. I want to sort out the differences. Would you and Matram be open to doing that? Honestly, I've sat down with Ben Shalom. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like Ben Shalom. <laughs> I don't like the way he operates. Like, I'm not going to sit here and lie. At the same time, I've sat down with Ben Shalom and I've told him, like, on a private level, but I haven't sat there and said, we're not going to do any business with you. We're not the ones standing in the way of doing business. Eddie Hearn is not going to have the headache of talking to Ben Shalom. That's Frank Smith's job, you know what I mean? 
And he doesn't like Ben Shalom and he's made no secret of it there. He doesn't like the guy. And he's asking, why do we have to sit down and talk with Boxer when they've pulled out of five fights with Matron fighters? And this is why media is infuriating. They're still talking like there's this standoff between Matrim and Boxer. When it's Boxer who fucked up all the fights. Where you want to go from Frazier Clark to Fabio. From Riyakpur, Jai Opataya. Caroline Dubois, Ferreira. Adam Mazim, Dalton Smith. And now we've got this situation here with Isaac Chamberlain and Chev Clark. Um, just want to clear up. Chev Clark tried to get involved. Uh, your mandatory for the British title. And there was a little bit of people jumping barriers. So, so we stopped it. Not because it was Chev Clark. But you've, you've got options now. Yeah. But Isaac doesn't have options. He's got his mandatory next. That's Chef Clark from Matchroom. And this is all conspired Sky Sports News and Boxer to once again overlook either a purse bid or mandatory obligations against a Matchroom fighter. Got questions to answer. So Yeah, of course. Do you want to fight Vidal? Do you want to fight Listen, obviously Chef that's, What do you want to do? I'm not going to lie. I like fights where everyone's... It's a big build-up. Everything's like, oh, big... Do you know what I mean? And uh, I think the Vidal fight is looking like the one that everybody's talking about. Who is everybody that wants to see Vidal Riley and Isaac Chamberlain? Who is everybody who wants to see Chef Clark and Isaac Chamberlain? That's bull crap. They're good fights, but it's not everybody in the UK who wants to see them. The difference between the two is one is a mandatory and the other is not. Sky Sports shouldn't be using the platform to advertise a Vidal Riley Isaac Chamberlain fight when you've got a mandatory against a match from fighter. Shouldn't be doing that. So almost immediately after Ben Shalom was saying, yeah, let's sit down and talk. Look what he's doing. And he's not going to come out and say we're committed to making sure that Isaac defends against his mandatory. He's not going to do that. Um, just want to clear up. Chev Clark tried to get involved, uh, your mandatory for the British mm -hmm. title. And there was a little bit of people jumping barriers. So, so we stopped it. Not because it was Chev Clark. My cynicism is not writing off they may have made a diversion so they could cut the interview and cut Chev Clark from out the broadcast. I mean, didn't Eddie say that boxer banned Dalton Smith from Adam Azim's last fight? If the Saudis can pull off this uh, American venture and debut with Terence Crawford headlining against Madrimov for that WBA 154 pound belt, Crawford might have finally found a home that he's been looking for for a long, 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 long time. Obviously, you know, the Spence Brigade and the anti-Crawford are saying that he's ducking boots to take on someone with 11 fights. But yo, the WBA belt will give him great leverage when they sort out that mess they have there with Fundora, Errol Spence, and Tim Zhu over there at the PBC. It will give Terrence great leverage. Not talking about all Spence fans, but a few in particular. You know, you'll accuse Crawford of ducking, but not even question how Errol Spence's name is in the mix based on his last performance. And we'll see who Crawford is ducking if he gets past Madrimov and he goes for his third undisputed weight class. We'll see who's ducking what. What I want to talk about is, sorry, just a bit like, you know, um, um, Richardson Hitchens, who he's fighting. Leon. Yeah. Listen. That guy can bang. At what level, though, can he bang? At level, level. Listen, I think he's like 90% knockout ratio. I think he's nearly knocked out everyone. He's undefeated. No, nah, he, 29 and 0, 19 knockouts. 19 knockouts. Oh, okay. He's 19 knockouts. I watched a couple of his fights and, oh, and his knockouts and his fight style. I don't, Richardson Hitchens, I don't know how he's going to keep him off him. Did did you watch the Lee Selby Lee must yeah. fight? Battered Lee, battered, dropped him, dropped him. Not yeah, but Lee Lee had his success, man. He had him cut, and only, he, had, he rocked him a few times as well. Only in the first, first or first, first and second round. Not by the fifth round, he was stopped, wasn't he? Fifth round, sixth round. Yeah, but Lee Lee's washed, man. Lee washed now, man. Yeah, you know what I mean, like, he didn't have no power. He couldn't yeah. keep. Once he couldn't, he, he just kept running in the end, Lee. He ran. Literally. Yeah, he, he, he got Selby at the right time, man. Got Selby yeah. at the right time. And I've seen him against, like, uh, other, other guys. But do you know what I've noticed? 
this is what I've noticed. The guys that he knocked out don't have power. There you go. Yeah. And he started at 135. And he's only five foot five. My man's got five inches on height, 74 yeah. inch reach. This yeah. guy, is, he's going to struggle. I feel he's going to struggle. I, I see them with the taller fighters, though. And he knocked them out. Yeah, but they're not Richardson. They're not... Richardson got that laser like jab, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Got I that think... laser. I think it's still going to be tough for him. You think so? I don't think so, you know. This guy's relentless. The pressure is relentless. Yeah, but when he takes a couple of them jet, them lasers. He's got a chin, though. Yeah, but like, he, who's, who's he got hit by? Like, like yeah. Richardson's not a big puncher, though. It, yeah, he's not a big puncher either, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Listen. I'm looking forward to it, though. I'm looking Me forward too. to it. Me too. It's going to be a tough one. Me too. Lady Chen saw things I didn't see. I was there talking up Richardson and she had it on the money. She had it on the money. He struggled to keep Lemos at bay. He did struggle. Richardson was the more accurate puncher. But this is professional boxing. And in a different scenario and location, he could have lost that fight pretty easily. He definitely landed more punches. The jab was key, even though it wasn't a snappy head back type of jab. I think um, either people weren't scoring that and they went ahead with the cheering, the underdog, and got caught up in that this was going to be a bigger story than initially thought, rather than a shutout points victory for Hitchens working behind that jab. I would have had no complaints if it went the other way, in all truth, because like I said, it's pro boxing. And there was a lot of stages where Hitchens leaned on too much. More than he was actually holding. He was leaning on a little too much, perhaps. And also, his punches didn't have the same effect when they landed as when Lemos hurt Richardson. Richardson asked some questions about the chin. He did dig down. Lemos shocked everybody the way he came out of that crouch and used his height deficit to his advantage as Richardson couldn't see where that overhand right was coming from. It was a very um, potent weapon, that right hand. And it was a fast punch. And this is something I overlooked in my breakdown. Argentinian fighters often look crude and they still land hard punches and give you all types of issues. The timing on that right hand surprised me. And it surprised Richardson. Gustavo went southpaw briefly in one of the early rounds and that was a mistake. He's getting tagged up. He hurt Richardson with that overhand right. I can't remember what round. Richardson though had him a little discombobulated. Lima seemed to be blinking and turning away from the action. But he got it together. He got it together. Richardson put together some nice combinations himself. Lima's threw more but Richardson was more accurate. When Lima's landed he did a little more damage. So does Richardson go straight ahead with this Matthias challenge as soon as it's available, as soon as um, we assume he takes care of Paro? We'll see. We'll see. Suicide, it's a suicide. For my money, it doesn't end well for him, but he has earned the right. And if he's called up, he should take his title challenge and take his lumps. Or perhaps he can step his game up. You never know. Uh, I did... Give a little attention to the 10 pound rehydration. He's used that as an excuse. He is using it as an excuse. You know what I mean? You got the W. You're still making excuses. It's not a good look. He said he barely ate or drank anything kept the way in. And had to sit in a hot tub to make the rehydration weight. Because of the IBF. And he still put on a performance. Well, Lemus had to adhere to the ruling as well. Like, I, I don't like fighters bringing stuff up that they signed up to. Why are you bringing that up? I understand the outrage if people think Lemus won, but that's one of the issues with boxing for me. If you see the public opinion out there, whether you're Lemus or Richardson, the obvious thing to do is run that fight back. Is run it back. Like, okay, if Matthias was available anytime soon, then okay, go ahead and do that. But Matthias has got the Paro fight. Richardson has only had 17 fights 
since 2017. It's not a lot of fights. It's not a lot of fights. He could do with getting another fight in. They're talking about progress, but I wouldn't go to progress. I would clean up this spillage here. Because it is a spillage, even though he won. It's a spillage. A lot of people think he lost. Go run this one back. A lot of people would like to see this fight again. Richardson talking shit about Devin. Talking shit about all these fighters. Well, if you're as good as the likes of Devin, this one and that one, run it back. I mean, Richardson done a lot of talking pre-fight. Saying, I saw Lee Selby hurt him and I'll box him. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And... He didn't deliver. He got a W, but he didn't deliver. You know? Like I said, it's not just about getting a W. We need to see superstar quality. Do you have it? And if he has hidden potential at 26 years of age, we need to start seeing it. Run that one back and let's see it. Let's see it. You know? Didn't shine. Dalton Smith, with that fifth round stoppage of Zabeda, made Richardson's points win over Zabeda depreciate. His stock isn't a hot commodity right now. You know what I mean? And that's the truth. But he got the W. He got the W. And if he fancies his chances, let's see him go in there with Matthias. Let's see him do it. Matthias would stop him from what I saw there. He'd stop him. It's normally winner stays on, but the loser on this occasion will be invited back to the zone cards. Eddie Hearn said he'd like to see Levis back on the platform. And that's good. Dalton Smith, if he's interested taking on another common opponent of Hitchens. Bring him to Sheffield. Let's see what he can do with Lemus. We know Adam Azim ain't taking that fight. Galau Yafai, 7th round stoppage over his Argentinian opponent, Gato. Head clash in the 6th. Bad cut over Yafai's right eye. He's fit. He's strong. I don't see any outstanding skills, but that cut could have derailed any Sonny Edwards fight this year. But as soon as he's fit and ready, he should take that fight. I, I don't think um, trying to build him up anymore. He's an Olympic gold medalist, you know. I'm not saying cash him out. But at this stage here, you've got to get him into world title fights. Or a big domestic clash with Sonny Edwards. I mean, Galal is 31. He's 31. He's in a similar position to Fraser Clark. I think he has the physical strength to give Sonny a tough fight, though. I actually do. Diego Pacheco moves to 21-0. Couldn't get a knockout against... Sean McCalkin, who gave him a lot of issues with his boxing ability. But Sean, it didn't look like he had the belief. You know, he began to hold a little too much rather than draw up that passion and really seize the moment. And Diego got to go back to the drawing board a little, I guess. You know, you can't just land a perfect shot. Got to learn how to put your punches together and punch from angles that you're not comfortable punching from. You have to also ask how long can he keep making 168? But, you know, he won a UD, done his thing. Sky Nicholson, I believe she's 28 years of age now. She goes to 10 and 0. She becomes the WBO featherweight champion. I'll say it if no one else says it. I think she has the defense to give Amanda Serrano all the trouble she needs. She's very confident right now. She seems well conditioned from that southpaw stance. She outpointed Sarah Marfood to win the belt. And she's young. Amanda, what, mid 30s? Amanda, I believe, is chasing the Katie Taylor fight, and I think that would be a better option than Sky Nicholson. Sky Nicholson got a whole load of legs. A whole load of legs. Her opponent, who took Amanda Serrano the distance, I believe, a couple of years back, didn't land any significant punches at all. At all. And Sky was enjoying herself in there. And that sums up the whole of that Nevada card on the zone. Peace.